Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, yes, please, make noise, make noise. I'm, I'm so excited to introduce you to, uh, to our performers and our speaker, um, and I'm really excited to welcome you to this very, very special event. Um, this is going to be the first in a series um, uh, called Rhythm in Mind, um, in which we're going to explore rhythm in all of its forms in the brain um, and also in the world of music. Um, and uh, it's going to be happening roughly every other month, so it's going to be continuing through the spring. Um, so what you're about to experience is, is a performance um, between the great Miguel Zenon, uh, our artist in residence. <laughs> And the equally great Obed Calvert. <laughs> Roughly halfway through the event, um, you are going to uh, hear a conversation between our musicians um, and Dr. Mark Churchland, um, who's currently sitting in the audience. Yes, you can applaud him too. <laughs> Um, and uh, if at that time you have questions for our scientists, for our musicians, then that is a great time to ask them. If you're in the room here today, you will need to come to me because this is my range um, and ask your question into the microphone so our live stream audience can hear it too. Um, and if you're on the live stream, you can just type your question into the chat and I'll read it out for you. Um, oh, my name is Paula Croxon. I run the public programs here at the Zuckerman Institute. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That was my performance. Um, <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to A Rhythm in Mind.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and so happy to have Obed here. You know, Obed and I, all friends, go back a long time. So it's always a pleasure to make music together and just to have you here is a, it's a treat. So thank you. Thank you for being here, brother. Um, so uh, like Paula mentioned earlier, the idea here is to talk a little bit about um, from different perspectives, that is, uh, what happens when we um, sort of think about rhythm conceptually and when we express rhythm in different ways. You know, Oban and I, we're not, we're not scientists, uh, but we think a lot about rhythm as musicians and we think a lot, of it, a, a lot about it in different ways. A lot of it is very conceptual and based on theory uh, and a lot of it has to do would feel and just kind of putting that into practice. So I was hoping that, you know, with Obed and with all of you, we could get to talk a little bit about these things and, and uh, hopefully find something interesting to, uh, to share. So I guess uh, the first thing I would ask uh, Obed is maybe to talk a little bit about that piece. That was an original piece of Obed's called uh, MC's World that we played together a, f a few years ago with an ensemble we used to play with uh, uh, called the SF Jazz Collective. Uh, so maybe you could think about, you could talk a little bit about the piece, the way you thought about it conceptually, and, and you know, uh, we could start there, maybe. Hello everyone, my name is Obed Calvere. Good to uh, be here in such a beautiful environment and I'm with my big brother, Miguel Zanon. Um, it's funny because we went to, I met Miguel right right around the corner, my high school music, Look, I'm see, wa looking at the dorms right there, and I'm like, wow, I remember those days. <laughs> um, so this piece, um, this, uh, my, my thought about, the, it, it's, it's in five for, for those who were thinking what the, what the um, time signature was, but I thought it'd be cool to, um, as the progressions went by, to compress more beats into a groupings of five. So if you're thinking of one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. So that, that pulse right there, first two courses are, are in five and then it gradually increases into seven beats. I'm not sure if you guys felt a little shift in the rhythm, you know, in, during Miguel solo. Um, that the third and fourth chorus uh, we played in seven and then the fifth and sixth chorus, I added nine beats in there, but still under the pulse of one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see what I mean? So that's pretty much what my thought process was in the beginning. And then uh, the bass line came to mind and then a melody, the, the melody that Miguel performed in the intro. Um, that was my process, like I kind of put more, because usually when I sit on the piano to compose, um, I'll just sit there and noodle, like drums are the last thing that come to mind. Um, but this particular uh, piece, I, I focused more on the rhythm aspect of it, and it, it's titled MZ's World because it's Miguel's and Nones World. Miguel loves exploring all types of rhythmic uh, combinations and, and uh, so I'm like, oh, you know, why, why not? You know, and this is, was his, I knew it was going to be his last year at the collective. So, so I said, you know, why not dedicate a, a piece to uh, to Miguel? And it, and that's how that piece came about. Thank you, brother. So um, maybe we could take a step back and talk a little bit about this idea of 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 pulse and subdivision, because I think that's one thing that's going to come back a lot. Um, and when I think about rhythm and I'm sure it's your case and, and the case of many of you here, when you think about rhythm within a musical context, right? Uh, a lot of times what I think about is, is layers, right? And, and, and how we kind of give certain layers more, more, of a, more of a role than others or more of a, more, more of a protagonism than others. And, and more often than not, the layer that's kind of be, what's kind of gonna draw us in is, is some kind of pulse. Right, something that's gonna okay. So we're kind of feeling this pulse, something that's constant and it's moving and it's kind of grounding everything else that's happening on top. You know, uh, now uh, I know there's a lot of musicians here and a lot of people who 
play instruments and understand musical terms. But when Ovid says the piece was in five, uh, what he means is that there's five pulses per phrase, right? So there's a, a large phrase, and within that phrase, there's five pulses. Uh, so that's why we're thinking about it. And then uh, he started talking about breaking up that phrase into different subdivisions, which means he was squeezing more pulses within the same amount of space. So five to seven to nine, and then going back to the fires at the end. Uh, so that's one way to think about it, right? We think about the phrase, the pulse, but also one thing that I wanted to ask you about, specifically Obed, from your perspective as a drummer, because one thing that's interesting to me uh, when, when playing with percussionists and drummers and, and uh, as, a, as, a, as a, you know, someone who plays a melodic instrument, I do think a lot about rhythm and try to practice it and, and everything, but I feel that you, Obed, like you kind of live that all the time. You know, that, that's kind of part of your DNA as an instrumentalist. Like you have to, uh, even if you're not doing it consciously or conceptually, like that's something that's just part of what you do, right? You have to keep a beat, you have to put a groove together, you know, and you have to orchestrate that within your instrument. You know? So I guess the first thing I would ask is, uh, when you think about, about pulse and subdivision, like for example, when we are playing now, a lot of what you were playing is kind of like going back and forth between twos and threes, like, you know, eight notes, 16 notes, and triplets, for example, to the beat. Uh, so when you think about that, do you usually think about it conceptually first and then sort of like try to put it into practice? Like think, okay, so this is something that might sound cool, and then you conceptually kind of think about, okay, so this is something that might work, and then you practice it and put it together. How do you get it from that point of like, okay, this is a concept which I understand, then I, I'm gonna internalize the, the concept and sort of like understand it enough that I can kind of sing it back to a beat or something, to a metronome, and then put it on the instrument. Great question. So for me, um, Great question. For me, uh, I remember the beginning stages when I started to explore subdivisions. Um, so if it, let's break it down. So if, 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 if our pulse is four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I want to live in a world where I don't have to think or make an effort to go in between different subdivisions. Like I want to be able to, for it to come out organically, um, in the, in, in, especially when I'm performing with someone like Miguel or whoever I'm performing with. Um, if they're expressing themselves um, melodically, sometimes the melodic, their melodic phrasing doesn't really necessarily line up with my subdivisions, right? So I want to be able to go in and out of the phrase freely um, so that the music sounds organic. So one exercise that I'll do, so let, let's say this is my pulse. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. And I line it up. Now if I want to go to eighth notes, now what, what are eighth notes? Basically double, double that. You just cut in half. One, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and one and uh, two and, now I'm triplets. That's my subdivision, right? Is that clear for everyone now? Now if you want to go a little further, 16th notes. One iana, two iana, three. All, all of those subdivisions line up with this pulse. One, three, four, one, two, one, and, and. One, two, three, four, five, one, two. Three. So now I'm getting, I'm expanding it more when I'm putting two bar, like a beat of five against four. Um, so that's something that I would, that's how it started for me. And then you f I figured out ways to orchestrate it around a drum. Just take something like a paradiddle, which is a gr group, groupings of four. One iana, two, paradiddle, 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 paradiddle. So if I'm playing a paradiddle, which you would usually hear in a groupings of four, now what happens if I take that? What happens if I take that same grouping and put it in triplets?
then your your rhythmic I, the the rhythmic universe becomes endless, and that's just groupings of four. Now you can go into seven, go into nine, whatever. It becomes infinite, you know. So that's how it all started with me. So when I when I'm thinking of subdivisions, like literally, I'm thinking of I'm at the stage right now where I don't think. Right. It's to the point where it's just whatever I'm being fed. I respond just like when we're having a conversation. We don't really think yep. about what yep. you know. Like you, you ask me a question, and I respond. So same thing. There are levels to that musically, yep. which I think is is w where it becomes more organic for me. Is where I can do that without thought. It just yeah, that's awesome. And 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 I want to kind of dig. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of points that we can make about what you just said when you just played. And I'm sure that a lot of people here would have stuff to ask and, and, and say about this. But kind of going back to that last point, for example, where you, th you were saying you don't think about it anymore, right? So there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that. Of course, you, I mean, you practice this over many years and worked on it enough that you don't have to think about it. And it becomes more of a reaction than an actual um, conceptual kind of thinking type of process. Kind of like conversation, you were saying conversation, or you know, you could think about this idea of like improvising with rhythm, right? Like you kind of using information you already have to improvise like we do when we speak, you know? Um, but then another thing that I was thinking about as you were, as you were playing and explaining what you, what you were doing and kind of going back to this reference of the layers, right? You were saying that you had the layer with the pulse and then the layer with the subdivision and then the layer on top of that, which was you're using the same subdivision and just changing the groupings. So or now I could probably do that pretty precisely if I did that on the saxophone and I put a metronome on uh, and I could sing it you know and tap it but I probably wouldn't be able to play it on the drums the way you did right because you practice the drums so I think I guess my my next thing would be you know, and this kind of relates to a lot of things, like, like you know, Mark and I have I've had conversations about this with, with movement, for example, and dance, you know, mm -hmm. whereas like, you know, someone like yourself, I've actually never seen you dance, but you might be a great dancer or not, you know? Well, you, don't have to, you don't have to say it, oh, you don't I have to say it. I mean, but, I, was going, I was about to break dance right but, now for you. But, <laughs> but what, I'm try, what I'm trying to say is like, you might have all this great, all this great rhythmic knowledge and ideas, and I've seen this, you know, and then you go on the dance floor and you might suck. You know, so <laughs> so what what so there is there is there might be a disconnect between knowledge and being able to internalize information and even a concept and actually being able to produce it, right. you know, like, at, at, you know, at a, at, in, in, in time, like related to a pulse mm -hmm. or something that's logical. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's the practice element. Then there's the, the sort of assimilation of a concept. But I think I feel that even within musicians and, 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 and you know, some professionals and amateur musicians and people who play instruments and playing it for a long time, there are l different levels of, of uh, you know, connection mm. to rhythmic information. And as rhythmic information gets a little complex, it might be harder even for professional musicians to connect with certain things. And you've seen this and I've seen this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, my question to you is, why do you think that is? Why? You know, I... I guess, let, let, me, pull this question, let me pull this question a little bit, a, a little different. Like, more from your perspective, right? right? As you've developed as a musician, and I know, I mean, Oban and I, we've, no, we've known each other for 20 years, and Oban's always been good. I, I know that, ever since I met him. <laughs> but, you know, obviously with time you get better, because you right. get more experience, and you play more, and you're exposed to most, more music, so you get better. So. At, do, over the course of your development as a musician, there, there had to be experiences of, of things that, you were, were, that opened your mind and said, okay, so this makes sense, and, and I'm going to kind of dig in into of this. Of course. You know? I mean, I think, like, to ex answer the question the the, your, in your original form, I think every, everyone's different, right? There's no, like, how I feel the same song is going to be different from how Jennifer feels it or how Mark feels it, right? Like, we just, even if we put a metronome on and we played the same exact pulse, it will never line up the same. 
that's just the nature in which we live in. Um, so f for me, even if I worked on something or someone, like one of our colleagues, for example, you know, I'm not gonna put our friend out there, but he, he knows this is coming out of love. Our bass, like the comment you made about dancing, so we, we play with an amazing bassist, Matt Pimmon, who has some of the best time ever on his instrument. <laughs> but, and I only say this because I used to record all of our shows with the SF Jazz Collective, and I would put it in between the bass and the piano. And man, Matt's foot would tap in a completely different tempo that had nothing to do with what we're playing. Right, am I lying or am I? Like it's, I'm like, man, how is it possible that his foot is literally on a different planet? <laughs> literally on a different planet, but his, like his time on the instrument is so heavy and strong. Um, so now can he dance? I don't know, I don't think I've ever seen Matt dance, but if I had to put some money on it, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put money on him dancing, I'm just saying. It, um, so I think, but I honestly think if the more we spend time with something, um, now to answer the, the, the later question, the more we spend time with something, I think um, as our, our human body, we, we adapt. You know, we have, uh, we, we have a really good, um, we, have our, we have a knack of, of, of adapting to whatever situation maybe, but I think most people aren't comfortable with putting, it definitely takes a lot of hours in order to, to adapt to something that's extremely uncomfortable, you know, and that's, I remember one tune that you wrote um, that had this groupings of six and seven or seven over six, you know, which, which, which what's the name? Infinito. Infinito. Now, I'm relatively okay in terms of independence, but for some reason that particular grouping was extremely uncomfortable for me. Like, I had to sit there and I'm not kidding, for at least, I don't know, 2,000 hours. I, I'm, no, I mean, he doesn't know this, but like, I would literally sit there and just beat by beat. Like, I would sometimes have to take a bar, get that in my system, and then add another couple beats, add another couple beats. Like, in order for my system to feel comfortable for that particular uh, independence to work out. So I think, um, I, and I say that from, now this is from my personal experience, the more you put your body through something, the more it adapts. That's just, you know, I think it's, it's as simple as that, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, and that's a conversation also that, that I've had with a lot of the folks here, this idea of familiarity, right? Like the more you, you connect to something and the more you can reference to something, the easier it's gonna be to adapt maybe to something that's new. Right. And if there's no reference or little reference, it might be harder. You know, and it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned this example because we've all had this experience where like, you know, within a subject we might be able to tackle a lot of things with, for, with a certain amount of, 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 of easiness, right? Like, and then there might be just something that we come up with and, and we're like trying to figure out why it is. Why, why, is, why, it? why is this? And, and, and a lot of it, at least in my experience, has to do with the idea that we just haven't experienced that, something like that before, so we have no reference. Right. You know, in a way, we have no reference, you know. Uh, and then you mentioned this other idea of practice, you know, like really putting the time to really internalize what it feels like mm -hmm. to be able to do something specifically, you know. And, and again, um, I mean, most musicians who are, uh, uh, you know, who are good at what they do, they spend a lot of time on their instruments and they practice a lot, you know. Uh, so I think there's a point where, like, you know, there's certain things that, that have to do with, with getting control of the of your instrument, be it your voice or your saxophone or your drums or your piano or whatever it is, and then putting that together with a concept, which is another thing, mm -hmm. and that that gap is might be harder for some, for some than others. than others. Yeah. You know, I have another question before I, uh, we play a little more, uh, and this has to do with with background. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Obed is Haitian American, mm -hmm. right? So I know that that that, uh, and and he's from Miami originally. Mm -hmm. So you grew up with a lot of things like in the pot, basically, like a lot of different, like a mixture of a lot of different things, both culturally and, and musically. I would imagine, you know, and 
uh, you know, he speaks Creole and very close to that, to that, that culture as well. Um, and there are certain things that I know, I mean, I don't know for a fact, but I imagine uh, in terms of connecting to certain types of music, like Afro-Cuban music, for example, right. that, that might have opened a door that, that, that was just an easier path to those kinds of things, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and maybe others, maybe it was a little harder. You know, I know you grew up in the church, too, playing large, the gospel and that right, kind of thing, right. so that came from that side, too. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that experience growing up with all those influences and how, and, and kind of going back to this idea of familiarity, right, and kind of like running into something and saying, oh, wait, this feels like this thing that I've been hearing my whole life, or like playing since I was five years old, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I'm just gonna phrase it a different way. <laughs> but it's, it's pretty much, like you said, if, if you're, um, like for example, when I fell in love with Afro-Cuban music, now mind you, I'm from, my, my mom and dad are from Haiti, and I, I actually really didn't get to listen to most folkloric Haitian music until I got older because most of that music is secular. Um, and my mom and dad are straight Pentecostal, heavy going church goers, you know. Um, so, but growing up in Haiti, growing up in, in the church, my early years before I started playing for American churches, um, they did imply a lot of the Haitian rhythm. So there, there was some, you know, there were some things that I could relate to once I dug into the folkloric uh, side of the music. And like this two against three thing, right? That is, is home for me, um, but most, when you leave the Caribbean, you come to the States, it's foreign. It's either one or the other. Most music don't really apply both. Um, so I remember when I first started playing straight ahead gigs and I would add some of these rhythms and I noticed a lot of, of my colleagues would get lost. They wouldn't know where one was. And I'm like, man, how do you not feel this? Like it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a vocabulary that you, I grew up listening to. I just assumed that everyone else understood. Um, now going back to the transformation when you know when I started hearing you know I remember one of the first bands I, I fell in love with was Los Van Van or Grupo Afro Cuba, you know like the Mantanza like all these Afro 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 Cuban rhythms. I'm like man, something I felt connected to to these rhythms, and it was because there's so so many similarities, and um and and how. Cubans, Puerto Ricans, you know, bomba, plena, all these, like, there's so much connection between the rhythms from Haiti, you know, th that I just could gravitate to, which is probably one of the reasons why I'm able to perform with somebody like Yosvani or Eddie Palmieri, because I understood the expansion and the compression of eighth notes. You know, once you, once you get into that world and you understand, okay, E either it's down the grid or it's a little ahead or a little, but you know, then it makes th it makes one uh, it makes it easier for me. I can only speak for myself. It makes it easier for me to be able to adapt into another culture. Um, so, it, it do, did I have it easier? I think so, to be honest with you, because of my background, because of the language that I grew up. I just grew up hearing, you know, compa, which is another rhythm from Haiti. I grew up listening to Yon Valu. I grew up li listening to Gaga. Uh, uh, you know, all these rhythms just gave me uh, an understanding of how to phrase something like, you know, rumba, you know, um, or playing a simple, straight funk, you know, 214 groove, you know. Um, so I, I think, yeah, going back, I just think. If if you grow up listening to something like if you grow up listening to a specific language, um, it's just as a baby they they don't learn how to read right that that the, I mean when you before they read they speak, you know and it's because everything is coming through here, and same thing with music everything is you know kind of registered in my brain somehow so when when it, when I sat down to perform it, it was just natural, you know that I mean that's the best. Yeah, that's that's, that's awesome, man. So 
I was hoping you could do something for us uh, real quick, and we talked about this before, and I think this would be a good way to kind of break down a lot of the things that we've been talking about. I was hoping you could play just like a simple kind of groove, mm -hmm. something we can all feel, something that can kind of, you know, narrow it to a, to a pulse type of thing, mm -hmm. and then maybe play variations on the groove the way you could go from something like simpler to something more complex. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. You could, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what's, what's the protocol? Okay. What's the protocol? All right. <laughs> Why not? I, th I think the rules allow dancing. Yeah. It's COVID safe activity. Now, I mean, now you got to dance. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Albert. So obviously, there's a lot of a lot of, a lot that we can talk about uh, in in every way, you know. But I would love to uh, get Mark up here. Mark, if you don't mind joining us, and uh, Mark and I have had conversations about this this stuff of uh, many of them. Uh, and I was hoping, Mark, you could give us a little perspective just from your side about. You know, this idea of expressing rhythm, you know, uh, through movement and through our bodies, through concepts that eventually come out through our instruments, you know, that kind of thing. Ooh. <laughs> Man, I've, I've, I think I've got too much to think about here. I mean, one, one thing you guys were talking about, I mean, just to even pop up a level for movement, is, is sort of almost something that kind of has to do with... Um, like, what does it even mean to know something, hmm. right? Like, you talked about intellectual knowledge, and then, like, you know, then, then there's what you can feel, right? And um, my father was, a, um, well, is a, a philosopher. He was also a, a, a very mediocre amateur musician that used to play in jazz clubs when he was a kid. And, and there's this question in philosophy, which you could say is deep or silly, depending on your perspective, of, you know, what does it mean to know something? And, you know, the, the answers that, that all the philosophers gave was always, well, you know, it's a list of logical statements or sentences or facts. And my dad was like, well, yeah, sometimes, but sometimes it's something you can see or feel or hear. And the two examples he had were um, the night sky, 
where if you don't know what you're looking at, it's just a bunch of stars. And you don't even know what planets are and what stars are. If you know what you're looking at, though, you can, you can imagine your tilt on the Earth relative to the paths of these planets. If you've never seen this, you, it's hard to imagine in your head right now, but you, you can look this up online. And once you see it, you kind of can't unsee it. And, and the other example he gave was, was 12 bar blues, that like once you've heard that form and got it in you, you, you just always know where you are in, in, in that form. And, and his point was that, that, that we sort of pretend that the deepest expression of knowledge is what we can say with words and write on pages. And some, sometimes it is and sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes that's actually how you get to the most important part, which is just the ability to see something or feel it or hear it. And it's really true. I mean, mathematicians, when they come up with, with proofs or good guesses about what might be true, a lot of that's just feel. I mean, they explain it with logic afterwards, but most of the time, they just sort of have good intuitions and good feel for these things. So anyway, that part of the conversation just kind of resonated with me, and I couldn't stop myself from talking about my father. So yeah, there you go. That, that, that's, <laughs> very, that's very cool. And, and that makes me think about the idea of, you know, the trained sort of trained musician, you know, like going to school and you read music and you know what a chord and, and like a you know what a bar is, yeah. you know that kind of thing, or you know uh, someone who just came up through folklore and might be at the same level musically, yeah. but will explain it or yeah. feel it in a totally yeah. different way, which yeah. unfortunately I can't really understand yeah. because I've already been kind of damaged by musical education you know <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's it's amazing for me to think about a musician coming from from cuba or haiti or puerto rico who learned to play from their parents and and is able to, to do all these amazing things but and which for us hearing it conceptually is mind-blowing but for them yeah. in terms of the way they think of it it's a totally different thing yeah. you know so it's a lot of it is perspective you know and a lot of it is like like you said like thinking about uh what it is that you know and, and how you can express it, you know, like with, with words or yeah. musically, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Would you agree, brother? Oh, man. You, you know, it's funny because sometimes I'm more connected to the musicians who aren't trained yeah. because it's so emotional to them. Yeah. And I would deny not being able to feel that same energy once they perform. You know, as yeah. Miguel said, I just remember as a kid, I was so... like. When you're naive, when you don't know, when you're, you know, like fearless, mm. you know, you get on the instrument and you do whatever you want, yeah. you know, and, and there's so much beauty into that. And then you go into school and they say, no, this is how it's yeah. supposed to be done. Yeah. And you sit on your instrument, you're like, <laughs> what do I do now? You know, like I'm going, I'm trying to go back to that little boy who just didn't care, you know, and I think there's so much beauty in, in, in and I mean, don't get me wrong, I love studying. I, knowledge is uh, beautiful. But I, I personally feel connected to hearing, for example, uh, um, Osain Del Monte. Now, th this Cuban band that we, we love, this guy has uh, a son who's got to be what? I mean, when he started playing, he was a little kid. A little kid. Five, and this, something I like mean, that. And when you hear this kid play, it's almost like, wow, connected. Whatever that means, to, he's connected, you know? Like, and I see that, I'm like, wow, that's what I want to get back to, you know? And like you said, like your, fa your father explained it real well, you know, like, man, what, what is, yeah. you know? And, it, and it's funny, you mentioned this other reference to like a 12 bar blues, right? Like a blues is a form that we all know, even if you don't know what that is, you've heard it. If you heard James Brown, and you heard any type, any expression, of most expressions of American music, uh, music from the United States, popular music from the United States, it has this embedded in it, right? This idea of the one chord to the four chord, and this this form, and thinking about you know two bars of four four, etc. And in a way, it's, it it it's correct. Like once you hear that, and you kind of like, and you can't really unhear it. You kind of hear it as a structure. But there are also different levels of, of complexity, even within mm -hmm. that, you know? Mm -hmm. And even the, 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 best, the best musicians in the world, the best trained and the most experienced can still lose their place depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. And brings me back to what Obed played just now, 
which initially I'm sure we all felt mm-hmm. and heard. And once he started breaking it down and getting it more complex, it was still very interesting. But I'm sure some of us were like, okay, so where did that to to go back? Where did that go? It was still there, but once he started to to go back, to get to to get to to back, to get to get to get to back, to get to get to get to get to back, to get to to get to, and once that started happening, it slowly like our attention starts going somewhere else. So it's not about that pulse that was there initially. It's about all the layers that are being kind of put on top of that. And brings me back to this idea of expression through movement, through, uh, how, you know, going from yeah. knowledge to like being able to yeah. manifest, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you guys have, have you know, brought up almost at the, at the beginning this idea of a, a felt pulse, which is like nobody really knows what that is, except we all know what that is, right? And it's this, Somehow it must, I think we all presume, but we don't know this, it has to do with the fact that movement, most biological movement is rhythmic, right? I mean, birds flapping their wings, people walking, fish swimming, uh, most movement is heartbeat. rhythmic. Say again? Heartbeat. Heartbeat, yeah. And, and there's also, kind of to your point earlier about three against two, there's often a couple rhythms going on at the same time. Like if you're walking, there's there's the one, two rhythm of your step, but sort of unbeknownst to you, your muscles are beating something closer to three within each rhythm. They, they burst to sort of accelerate the limb, and then they pause while the limb is moving, and then they, they burst during some co-contraction to stabilize the limb at the end. And so there's almost like a hidden three versus, uh, sort of three beats inside every beat. I mean, it's almost like, well, I mean, maybe you could bust out a blues shuffle for us. It's almost a little like that, right? It's like you've got, a triplet hiding inside each pulse. And is it one pulse or is it three quick? I, I don't know. But so I wouldn't claim to have any real knowledge of any of this, except I think we all suspect that there's some connection between our motor systems, which we don't just use for walking, we use it for speaking too. And you brought up the example of, of you say something to him, you've got an idea in your head and you make these sounds and somehow the idea is in his head now. Like you just told him, you know, where the cookies were and now he knows how to go find the cookies. And it's like somehow you're doing that with music too, right? You have a musical thought and you make these sounds and they go inside my head and you've put some thought in my head. But it's a very abstract thought, right? It's not a concrete thought about where cookies are. But it still has meaning and often emotional meaning. But why that is, I don't know. But yeah, somehow it's all connected to our motor systems, the fact that we use them for moving and the fact that we use them for language. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I was hoping maybe uh, we could address a couple of questions or any thoughts about any of what we talked about. Or Yes. Can I, can I get you to come up? Thank you so much. Awesome. So you talked a lot about all the different subdivisions and, and one over another. Uh, but then also when you, at one point you talked about stretching the beat a little bit or shrinking a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how those relate to each other or more generally, you know, getting a little ahead of the beat, getting a little behind the beat, and as, as a drummer, do you do that, or is it your job to make the beat so the other musicians can get a little ahead of it or a little behind it? How, how does that come into it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, so for example, if, if, if you want to, you know what, let's, let's, let's me, put me, so I have a friend that I love, this friend of mine is extremely close to me, dear to me, and it's called a metronome. <laughs> <laughs> My best friend. There's no, there's no, escaping. no escaping. <laughs> Truth. Very honest. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me. So, if 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 you're hearing this, right? So if I want to play straight down the grid, straight down the middle. Right. Now, if I want to play behind the beat from this, now what that means is I'm playing a little behind that pulse or that beep. Can you hear that? Now, if I want to play ahead, now I'm being very drastic right now. 
I wouldn't get a gig if I were playing this. <laughs> so now, let me put it in context. Um, so if I wanted, to, if if we're playing something in straight eighth, right? Like this is the difference between when you're when you're playing straight eighth music and swing. So I'm gonna play th three beats inside of this pulse. That got that. That got that. One two three. One two three. One two three. Right. Now, if I want to play a little behind, I'm that pulse. I'm gonna stay inside the pulse, but I'm gonna stretch out the second beat. Does that make sense? You hear that? You hear the difference? So when I say compressing or expanding, that's kind of what I mean. Now, this is a simple version of it. Sometimes I'm doing it outside of that grid. Those beats. Sometimes it's a little ahead, sometimes it's a little uh, before. Um, so that's where this becomes infinite because Brazilian music has a certain way of swinging, Afro-Cuban music has a certain, now we call it swing, which is a, a slang for uh, feel. You know, it, it, it's gonna sound completely, like a, a Memphis shuffle is gonna sound completely different from a Chicago shuffle, you know, but it still feels good, but those eighth notes compress and, and expand a certain way where you could kind of tell the difference between the, the two, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think to your question, there are different sort of ways of thinking about it and lines of thought, because some people actually feel that any feel, any, any kind of ahead of the beat, behind the beat, uh, you know, feeling the eight note different can actually be gridded, you know, so be within a grid, you know, within a subdivision. So like he was saying, for example, Brazilian, like a Brazilian sort of feel, which instead of being taka 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 might be taka 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 Now, if you slow that down, that will feel kind of like, to me, it will feel like a seven against four, right? So there's different ways of thinking about this, was like he, when he was saying, I'm playing ahead of the beat, he might have just been playing a sextuplet ahead of the beat or a quintuplet again of the, against, uh, ahead of the beat. He might be thinking about it or not, but some people actually feel that everything, every feel, can be actually reduced to some kind of grid, to some kind of subdivision, and then from that subdivision you can kind of move in and out. Now, most, most people don't think this way, obviously. Some people naturally feel, naturally play ahead of the beat or behind the beat, and that's what makes them good you know that's what makes playing with them good you know like some of the greatest drummers and bass players that's what they why they play so much you know because it feels good to be a little behind or a little ahead depending on the situation but it's a it's a great question and it's something that we could talk about i think for a long time um so i have two questions the first one is about like adaptability because i know that you were mentioning it's weird to hear your voice up there. Um, <laughs> you were mentioning that like the more you practice and the more you get comfortable with like the different pieces of music and different types of um, genres and things like that, you get more um, able to adapt to different changing situations. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering for both of you, like are there ways that that's kind of manifested in your personal life, like alongside, not just musically, but like has that helped you adapt to changing situations oh, in man, the world? Oh man, that's a great question. And then um, you you want to talk? Okay, so for, for example, um, uh, if, like life, like we're, all, we're old enough, right? Let's talk about life, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, in order for a relationship to work, there has to be some type of compromise, right? Compromising means you need to adjust to certain things that you may not necessarily like, but you and your partner you want this to work, so I mean, it could be something stupid as you know not putting on the cap of the toothpaste that you've been you haven't done since you were a kid. Mom and dad never told you to put it on, so why should you continue to do it now? But you you start a relationship and you're like, okay, now I have to adjust this adjustment. I need to make. It's it's as simple as that. So like if 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 um. Like I have a I have a, a two month two two year old boy who's about to turn he's about to turn two in December. You adjust to what 
his world is because it's not it's no longer about me right i have to make this child's world as comfortable as possible which means sometimes i have to wake up at three in the morning to comfort him and do all type of all things that i wouldn't normally do it, because there's there's compassion there's and i'm and i'm i'll get back to the musical thing about compassion and you love this particular thing so much that you would, I would sit here for literally an hour and a half on just one little thing because my body's not used to feeling that particular rhythm. My body's not used to feeling that particular. So I need to make an adjustment and my body at some point will, will, will adjust same way that I wouldn't mind. Maybe I would do mind waking up at three in the morning. Okay, you know, you pat him down. <laughs> you come. But that's an adjustment that you know, it, it, it's it's worth it for me. I can't speak for anyone else, but it's worth it for me. Now that's just life, you know. I think us as human beings, for example, if you love dancing, um, or break dancing, let's let's go, let's go with break dance because that's a little physical. Like you got to get on your head. You got to do all types of. There's a level of strength that that requires that. I mean, I'm not gonna demonstrate, but <laughs> that's a different check, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, you, you train your body to be strong enough to do certain moves. You know, to be put yourself in certain positions um, so that you look cool. You know, so. It, it all goes back to okay. So what am I? What sacrifice am I willing to make in order to become great at whatever it is that I want to be great at? Whether it's be a good husband, be a good what father, whatever it is, you know. I think when I when I say that, you know, we adjust. That's what I mean by you know, like we at some point we just do what's necessary in order to to do or to feel what we want to feel in that particular situation. And you had another question. Would that makes sense? Yeah, I have um, one more question. And I like that you brought up feel again, because I think it's really interesting that when we talk about music and we talk about pulse, we use those words like feel. And when we talk about emotions, we use words feel as well. But how much of that do you think is things that we actually feel on our bodies and like through somatic sensation? Um, or is it more of that like no, that inner knowing or like connectedness that you were mentioning? Um, kind of the intuition sixth sense kind of thing? Mm. Um, or are those like the same thing? Do they go together? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would love to hear what you have to say, cause, but I, I think what's, what's interesting about that question is this idea of like something, for example, if we, if we when, when Obed played earlier, you know, he played that groove, we all felt it and he felt good. You know, we all connected to it kind of immediately because we understood what was happening and it, it, it kind of felt comfortable, right? And I think as musicians, you know, uh, we can kind of re react to things and kind of recognize when something doesn't feel good and comfortable, you know, and there's many reasons for that, right? It might be just personal taste, or it might be familiarity, it might just be that it's not happening, you know? <laughs> uh, but I would love to hear what you have to say, brother. Uh, you know, it, it's weird, because this is, a, like for example, if you, if you notice, if you um, see, and I'm bring, I'm going back to kids because it's so fascinating to me how kids react to things that they're not taught. It's just in their DNA, right? So I remember when I have a 12 year old daughter. So going back to my oldest, <laughs> like when she was growing up, certain things that she would dance to, certain things that she would react. Like how does she know? Like how does she? How do you explain that? You know, and I, when it when it comes to feel, like for example, when I started, I could see from the peripheral this whole crew. You know, <laughs> everyone would just do this. You know, like, and it, it I don't think it necessarily have, has to be something as simple as that because I think um, it could also be a rhythm that's completely not something that you're used to. Like, some uh, if I played a groove in seven or groove in nine, um, I think. People are connected to different types of uh, rhythms. They're connected to different types of sonic um, s sounds that just they are connected to that moves them emotionally. So when you talk about feel, 
you know, f rhythm rhythm is very very interesting because it it could it's like it can create these emotions that can make you feel sad, can make can make you feel angry, can make you feel you know there's it puts you in a cathartic state, you know, like it has so many different. Um, I want to say power, you know, like, you know, when soldiers go into war, back in the days, they would have a drum, drum line to prepare them, to gear them up, to do whatever's necessary to survive that day or whatever, you know, so, so it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful yet amazing tool that we have in, in, on this, on this planet of ours that, you know, rhythm, you know, like, can I explain how, why it makes you feel a certain way, My, why, your 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 dynamic just changed because of something I may have done on the symbol. I mean, it, it's it's very difficult to explain, but yet I think it's beautiful. I don't think it needs to be tangible in order for me to feel a certain way because it, it it's also special to me that it just because I can't connect to it physically. That's what makes it even more special to me. To be honest with you, you know, if that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mark, you're a neuroscientist. Do you want to add anything? Why, do you, why is that, do you think? I don't know. I'll, I'll be a neuroscientist and just ponder a mystery, which relates a little bit to, to Ken and, and Obed's conversation earlier, right? Which is like, <coughs> there's the felt pulse. It's not necessarily exactly where the sound that Obed's playing is, right? He's implying, and, you know, it takes you know, ridiculous amounts of practice and listening to be able to do this, but he's implying a pulse in a certain place without always making a sound in exactly that place. I mean, sometimes he does. So that, that's an interesting mystery, right? Like, how can the drummer be behind the beat? Wouldn't that just pull the beat backwards? Well, eventually it would, but somehow he's <laughs> able to skillfully imply the pulse in a place, even though he's playing around that beat a little bit. And that's really fascinating to me, but that's more of a mystery than a... Tension and release. I love that. I yeah. love that. You know, we, to create some type of tension that, that I, clearly people feel, you know, and then when you hit that, boom, like, it's like, ah, it's there, you know. You know, I, I, it, it's, still, it's still something that I'm trying to understand and connect to, but that's music that I love to listen to has a lot of that in it. Yeah. And there's something about it like people, well, hopefully people love drummers. Nobody loves metronomes, except you, apparently. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but people have very negative feelings towards their metronomes. <laughs> there's something about having a little movement. Or, sorry, I'm not talking to the mic as, enough. But there's something about having that movement that creates a feel, a, a felt pulse inside of you that's more satisfying than just the sound, right? right? right. I think this gentleman had a question. Should we do one more? Yeah, we have one more over here. Yeah, come to me. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about this connection between the rhythm and the movement. Um, so as you were playing that uh, groovy thing, um, you know, I noticed that at the beginning it was simple and I felt very groovy. I was trying to move. You know, I, was, I, could, not, I could not move. You know, I could just, I really wanted to dance. And as you were adding more and more layers to this, um, even though the rhythm was the same, as you said, right? It was just you're, you're adding layers to it, but the groove part of it was not as much in my subjective perception. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed that you know at the beginning people were moving and then they stopped as it got more complicated. Right, right, right. So uh, you know, in this context of um, perception of a rhythm and movement and how these two are connected, I wonder if you guys have any comments. Uh, well, you know, it's 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 funny. So. Um, I mean, how do I explain this? For someone who now I'm, I have to go into the trained world, you know, like I've, I've, for me, so for example, if, I, if I'm playing this rhythm, right? Everyone can connect to that, right? So in my head, regardless of whatever I do, I'm still feeling that. Right, 
ta ka ku ku tu ku tu ka 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 ku 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 ka ka ku tu ta 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 tu 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 ta 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 tu tu ta 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 tu 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 ta 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 so when you say no one no longer feels that right so that's obviously i'm not doing my job grandma's not tapping her feet anymore that's a problem right but in my head whatever i do i'm still feeling this ta ta tu ta tu ka you see what I mean? That was awesome. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, yeah. still <laughs> I'm still hearing that, you know, but it might not be underlined because now I'm, I'm exploring these rhythmic, you know, different rhythmic avenues where it's like, oh, okay, now it explode. But in my head, I'm, that's pretty much what I'm thinking, or I'm feeling, I should say. And, and you know, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Nima, because, well, first of all, when you play that groove, when Ipo goes boom, bop, we all kind of feel this, right? Boom, bop, like one, two, but why is that, right? Mm. Why not one, two, two, one, why is that not one? Why is the snare not one and the bass drum is one? There's something, not, I mean, there's something to that and that has to do with the type of music that we listen to that tells us, like, if we think about, you know, Billie Jean, boom, bop, boom, bop, ding, dun, dun, ding, 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 right? Like, immediately, like, we have references that tell us that's what's happening, right? Or why is not that not in the upbeats? Boom, got, boom, got, boom, right? We have references to tell us that immediately we connect to that, right? And then to Nima's point, once you give us that information and you say, okay, this is where it is, right? We're looking for it, right? With our ears, we're going, okay, I know that's my reference. That's once you start creating more and more variations, we're going, okay, where is it, right? Because you hear it, of course. You hear it, and I was counting, and I was, okay, so this is where it is. But even if it's not there, which is what Mark was saying before, you're playing something, you're thinking about something that's not being played, right. but it's still kind of there, which is kind of like this underlying pulse. The pulse is there, but the information that you gave it's us not. at the beginning, the, mel the rhythmic melody is not, mm -hmm. right? So there's like different layers to this idea, you know, of like connecting to the pulse or how you express it, you know, while you play. Mm -hmm. Different levels of, of, of difficulty, of course, and how you, you do something, you make a decision to take it in this direction or the other, which might leave the original melody and then come back, you know? Right, right. I think that's, that's the way I think about that, for example. Yeah. How are we doing, Paula, with time? We, we, well, I was hoping you might play a little more. Yeah, sure. How, yeah. how about a little bit of that? We've, we're, it's about 10 past five now, so. Yeah, okay. Maybe we'll play a little more. Well, first of all, how about it once again for Obed Calvea? Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and Mark Churchland, of course. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Mark. Awesome. Cool. This has been amazing. Thank you all for joining us. We're hoping to have uh, this happening uh, at least once a month or every couple months, and it's great to have you all here and sharing this, this time. So we're going to finish it off by playing another piece. This is actually a, a really... Um, sort of like a jazz classic uh, by the great Dizzy Gillespie called A Night in Tunisia, and we're gonna play it, we're gonna do a little spin on it, uh, sort of our own way, so hope you enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Everybody, Miguel Zanon, Nobel Calvert. And a special thanks to the very wonderful Mark Churchland. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, all of you, for a really wonderful event. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we hope to see you next time, next month, for the next one of these uh, in the series. Thank you. Oh.